Praise the Lord, everybody. I want to greet you in the mighty name of Jesus, our God and our King. Amen. I want to greet you in the exalted name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you for tuning in one more time to our Bible study. And I pray, oh God, that every child of God who is watching tonight will be encouraged by the word. Amen. Will be encouraged by the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. And in a season where the enemy is rampant, in a season, amen, where the devil seemingly, seemingly have uh, getting some victories on his side, amen, we are encouraged that, amen, we serve a God who never loses any battle. And I pray God that somebody's heart, amen, will be enlightened, somebody has been encouraged to go on in this battle, amen, and to go on to the end. Praise God. You know, for the past couple of weeks, we have been covering different aspects of the Christian journey. Amen. We looked at the Christian heritage. We looked at what the child of God, amen, the things that were dear to us as children of God. Amen. The things that the devil is trying to rob us of. And we come to the conclusion that every child of God must hold on to our heritage. Amen. Because it values much. Amen. We look at the fact that, amen, when you find something that is of value, amen, the Bible tells you that the man who found that pearl and he was willing to sell everything he had, amen, because he found something that was valuable. And we look at the fact that this heritage that we have, the apostolic heritage, praise God, amen, the enemy want to rob us of our, amen, our heritage. He want to rob us of what we truly believe, amen, he want to rob us of the doctrine, of the teaching, amen, that we hold dear to our hearts, amen. Rob us of stuff, amen, the name of Jesus Christ. He wants to attack the deity of Jesus Christ, but we come against it because we know that Jesus himself died for this, amen. The other week, after that week too, we looked at the Christian identity and we identified who we are in Christ. And it's important for each and every one of us to not only know where we are coming from, but we must know who we are, amen. And we look at the fact that, look here, we are just not any normal person, amen. We said we are not a chicken, but we are an eagle in Christ, amen. We did declare that, look here, we have to know who we are, amen. And when we know who we are, the devil trembles because we realize that we are a royal priesthood, according to Peter. We are a holy nation. We are a peculiar people, amen. We look at the fact that we are the salt of the earth, Amen. And we are the light of the world. Praise God. We look at the fact, amen, that we are ambassadors for Christ. Amen. And as ambassadors, amen, we are going to do the work of Christ. We, we are just pilgrims passing through. Amen. But our true identity, amen, is not in our past events. It's not what we did, amen, five years, six years ago. But our identity is in Christ. Praise God. Then we, the week after that, we look at the Christian walk, which was last week. And we say that the Christian walk is a journey. Amen. We declared, praise God, that look here, in this walk we're going to have ups and we're going to have downs. We say we're going to have mountaintop experiences, praise God, and we're going to have valley experiences, praise God. We look at the fact that even as we go along this Christian walk, amen, we realize that you're going to have, amen, enemies that we fight against, praise God. We look at the fact that the world is our enemy. The Bible says, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Praise God. We look at the fact that the devil is our enemy. Praise God. And you know, the truth be told, we said the devil goes round as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And we look at the fact that your flesh is also your enemy. Praise God. But as children of God, when we are aware of who our enemies along the journey, amen, we can go through, amen, knowing that, amen, we are fully aware of what we are fighting against. Praise God. And we can become victorious in this walk. Amen. I will look at the fact that even when you're going through your valley experiences, the, 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 what God is trying to do is to make you into a valuable pearl. Amen. Praise God. We look at the fact that how the pearl uh, was made. Look at the fact that grain of sand goes into uh, the crack and it causes irritation for the oyster. And that irritation allows it to secrete and create a coating. And eventually, out of all of that agony, amen, the pearl is produced. Praise God. So we did say that you have no wound, no treasure. In other words, if you don't go through uh, certain, cert certain circumstances, certain situations, at the end of the day, there will be no treasure. 
The pearl is created based on the fact that there is agony, based on the fact that there is discomfort. Amen. In a similar way, when there is discomfort in our lives, amen, sometimes God allows it that he can bring out of us what he wants. Praise God. And tonight, praise God, we're going to look at our Christian destiny. And it's important for us to understand that while we are walking this Christian journey, we're not just walking uh, aimlessly. We're not just walking with nothing in mind. But we are walking this Christian uh, journey because there is a destiny ahead. There is something that God has in store for us as children of God. And if we are faithful to him, if we are faithful to the call, amen, we can be assured that God uh, is going to give us those promises that he has for us. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So as we look at our Christian destiny, I want to start with the scripture in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11. And it says, And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, in Exodus chapter 12, Amen. If you can remember the story of Moses, uh, Moses was the one who God sent, amen, to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt's bondage. Praise God. And it so happened that we know that he went through certain plagues. Uh, Egypt went through certain plagues uh, because they did not want to release the children of Israel. The Bible said God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Amen. And we know what happened eventually after the last uh, plague. Amen. They were allowed to go. And God gave them a command in Exodus chapter 12 in terms of what they should do. He said, look here, I want you to get a lamb. And he said, I want you to get a lamb for every household. Amen. And if that lamb is too much for a particular household, then share it with your nearest neighbor. Amen. But everybody must have a lamb. Amen. He went on to say, look here, man, I want you to do something. I want you to kill that lamb. Amen. And, and on the 14th day of the month, I want you to kill the lamb. And I want you to put the blood on the doorpost. And that, that night, which was their last night in Egypt, God gave them a command in terms of how they should eat the lamb. Amen. And this was interesting to me because God stated four things that was important to him. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 12 that when they're about to eat the Passover lamb, they had to eat it with their one, their loins girded. In other words, your waist must be ready. You're ready to leave. Amen. You are out. You know, it was Peter who said, gird up the loins of your mind. And this is where the whole terminology comes from. When the Jewish man's loin is gird, it means that he is ready to move. He's ready to work. Amen. So God said, look here, make sure when you're about to leave. And this is the night before they were about to leave. Ensure that your loins are girded. He said, make sure that you have your sandal on your feet. In other words, get your, it's not like you have it beside you, but have it on from tonight. He says, third, you must have your staff in your hand. And you must eat the lamb with haste. Amen. I strongly believe that what God was saying to the children of Israel, amen, is that they should be ready at this time. I mean, ready now to leave. Amen. Have your mind so set on going out. Amen. That nothing can distract you. Everything that you need in, should be in place already. You must have your loin girded. You must have on your sandal. You must have your staff in your hand. Eat with haste. As a matter of fact, eat everything. And if, if you leave over anything, don't let it go over for the other day. Burn it. Amen. Because guess what? We're going to leave and we have to do it right away. Amen. So we can deduce brothers and sisters from that particular scripture in Exodus chapter 12 and we can apply it to the Christian life today. So what I got from that and why I started here is that the focus is to be on where God is taking us and what God has in store for us. As children of God, as we are at the brink, in my opinion, of leaving this dredged world, this wicked world, amen, God is giving us the same command. We must have our, God, our lines girded, the, the lines of our minds girded to the sense that we are ready to leave, amen. The focus in our minds must be where God is taking us, amen. We're from, 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 we should not be so concerned, amen, about the things that are in this life. 
even though you must occupy until he comes, amen, it's important that in the back of our minds, amen, we are ready, we are focused on where God is taking us, amen. And this means that if we are so focused on where God is taking us, our walk, our Christian walk, it should be one of faith. Amen. Because none of us have been to heaven before. Just like the children of Israel when they were in Egypt. They knew Egypt. Amen. They knew of what they got in Egypt's land. Amen. But God was saying, get yourselves ready. Get your loins girded. Get your sandals on your feet. Get the staff in your hand. Eat with haste. Because I'm going to take you to somewhere. I'm going to take you to a place. Amen. They have never been to Canaan before. Amen. But God says, I'm going to take you a place that flows with milk and honey. Amen. And in a similar way, God is saying to us as children of God today that I'm going to take you somewhere. You have never been there before. Amen. I hear people criticize all the time and say, boy, you're talking about your pie in the sky. Amen. And people talk about these type of things in criticizing amen, where God is taking us. As children of God, amen, we must be ready ready to leave amen so our walk as christians should be a walk of faith trusting on the deliverance promise of our lord jesus christ but as we amen look uh, as we think about this amen it's important for us to sometimes do a retrospect to do a look back on what is happening in the world today Amen. And, and why I want to go here, because I want us to understand that as we do this Christian work, amen, a lot of us have become uh, troubled, have become hurt, hurt by what we are seeing happening in our world today. If we should look back over the past 10 years, amen, in certain areas, we'll realize how distressing this world is. We'll realize that, look, at the end of the day, why should I amen, put my hope in this world? Praise God. So as we look back in retrospect, we realize, for example, in 2010, eh, it, as it relates to natural disasters, there was a uh, 7.0 magnitude earthquake that hit Haiti and Hispaniola. And many of us remember this, praise God. And it killed an estimate about 200,000 or 250,000 people. And it affected some 3 million people in Haiti. Can I tell you something? That's, that, 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 that shows us that this world has gone crazy. Again, we look at stuff like several massive hurricanes and tropical storms that has taken place over the years. For example, in 2012, you can remember Hurricane Sandy. Amen. And that hit the northeast coast of the U.S., Amen. And it is said that it killed about 230 people and caused some $70 billion worth of damage. In 2017, we had, we had about some other major hurricanes that came on the scene. For example, Harvey and Irma and Maria. And, and these places trucked in the state, in Texas. And a lot of people were hurt by what took place. Uh, in these things. And then, then just to bring it back to 2021, in recent time, as close as today, amen, we are seeing uh, there's a massive rain in China. Now, it is said that the rain that is falling in China, they have never seen so much rain in the last 1,000 years. They can check it out. They say the amount of rain that they get in three days is equivalent to one year's worth of rain. I know what happened since that rain start fall over 25 people have already been they found dead dead and their subway seem to be uh underwater amen and 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 I, and I wanted to look at the, the screen praise God to show you an example of, of of what is taking place over there in China amen and this was a these are pictures that came out of out of out of that setting you can see uh people looking on and you're trying to rescue people and a lot of people are trapped in cases they i think they had to go to a particular school to rescue some young people from the school of the overview it, it, the place is just fully underwater i know what is funny in three days they got so much rain and it is still raining even now no i don't know about you but something tells me that this world is not getting any better Amen. They talk about climate change and what these, the world is not getting any better. Why should I put my hope in this particular world? When we look at the political scene, brethren, amen, we see that 
first of all, we are living in a decade that 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 is on a, a week of what you call a chaotic global financial crisis. You can remember in about I think 2007 where everybody thought that this world was going to crash. Amen. This, there was a great inflation. Amen. A lot of things were happening and the world was just under under. I, I won't even know how to describe the term. Amen. But it was practically. In, in a chaotic state on the financial scenes, many stock markets seem to be crashing. Amen. A lot of things were just going down. People were wondering what is going to happen next. Amen. And everybody was trying to find uh, what is going to happen. They were, they, were, they, were, they were afraid about what is going to happen to the world in the, in the sense of the financial scene. Amen. I can even go further. In, for example, in quite recently, July the 7th, we heard about the assassination of a Haitian president. Can you imagine? No, Haiti has always been a country that have issues. That's the truth. But we have not heard of any assassination within many, many years. Praise God. And here we are finding that people are walking up and, and, and was able to, to kill amen, the, the president. This world is crazy. Then you have the massive protests in Cuba. Now, Cuba, on the other hand, we know that, that when Fidel and, and, and his... Um, party was in power for many years that country seemed to be under control amen but now there's a new set of people in power amen. Fidel has passed away amen his brother has resigned and we have a new set of people in power and for the first time now we are seeing and it's all over the news on CNN we are seeing a lot of craziness happening in, in, in a place like Cuba and it, it, it tells me because around the world we are seeing a lot of crazy things happening it tells me, brethren, that we are on the brink of something. This world, amen, is becoming crazy and crazier. Amen. We, you can remember, it doesn't even come to mind right now, Brexit that happened a few years ago. Amen. Where, uh, where, the, where the people in Britain voted like uh, 52 to 48 percent. Are uh, 52 to 40 percent in favor of the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union, and that was a major thing for, for years. Uh, the Britain have been a part of the European Union, and that coming out is really a sign. And if you study a prophecy, you realize that look here, this is a mark, this is something that the enemy, I mean, something that the scriptures practically talk about. Sorry, and what it's saying is that at the end of the day, there's going to come up this madness as it were in the in the in the governments of the world and they're going to happen that the antichrist is going to come out and he's going to be able to solve some of these issues amen we'll look at the the moral uh perspective of what is happening in the world we have seen mass shootings over the world can you remember in a school in newton connecticut by the name of sandy hook elementary school praise god and in that particular school praise god we realized that people came in and they were shooting amen i mean mass shooting all over the world parkland in florida and dozen other amen schools we're seeing where people just get crazy come in and start shooting up the place amen nowadays quite recently on the news here in jamaica i saw a, a snippet the other day of what is taking place i think in denham town and, and I was wondering if I'm watching Iraq, amen, because you see the police with their guns and they're coming back and they're firing shots and all kind of thing happening. And you're like, is this Jamaica? I mean, it, I saw it uh, on social media and it shows me, brethren, that we are living in a world that is crazy. We also see the advance of the LGBTQ rights. Praise God. Now, around the world, we see many same-sex marriages happening and have been legalized in about 18 countries they are legalizing what you call same-sex marriages and this has happened within the last 10 years so you have countries like argentina close countries like france like great britain australia ireland germany and the united states just to name a few and we see where the supreme court decision uh to has decided in these countries Amen. To legalize same-sex marriages. Praise God. And then you have stuff like anti-gay laws that are being passed in places like Russia and China. 
Amen. And there is a battle that seems to be going on right now in the United States about preventing transgender people from using bathrooms, uh, matching their gender identity. So in other words, if somebody, amen, was a man and him changed himself to a woman, they're saying that they, they're trying to say, that, okay, because now he's a woman, he can use the bathroom with the woman. Amen. The world has gone crazy. We look at stuff like the terrorist attack. Several terrorist attacks has taken place in the last 10 years. Praise God. Uh, you can remember the other day when you had the Boston Marathon. I mean, when the guys were running and out of the blues, uh, you, you see this big explosion. Amen. You have places like Paris and France and you have the London Bridge. And you have a lot of things that has happened within the last 10 years. It shows that the moral fiber of this world has gone crazy. Amen. And then we, we talk about... Uh, even in our country, Jamaica, amen, the, it seems as if the men's heart have become very, very, very wicked, amen. You can remember in about March of this year, where they found the body of the 20-year-old girl, amen, in Portmore, amen, and, and, and uh, along the Dyke Road section, and she got a drive from somebody who probably was making a move, and they couldn't find her for days, and when they do find her, amen, she was dead, amen. So that men's heart have become wicked, and, and you know what, the one that strikes me the most, in quite recent time, we see where a four-year-old boy, amen, died at the hospital, and, and, and how did he die? Because his, his stepfather beat him. And why he beat him? Because he was not eating too fast. He was eating slowly. Amen. And therefore, he beat him to the point where he was dead. Praise God. And, 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 and not only that, while he was getting the beating, the mother was trying to stop it. And the man was even fighting off the mother herself. It shows that the heart of men have become wicked. Amen. Praise God. Morally, men have lost their fear for God. Uh, people have no more reverence or respect. Amen. For the house of God. Amen. And they don't have no respect for the men of God. And they have no respect for the things of God. I don't know about you, but this world, amen, as we travel along this journey, a lot of hearts have become sick and hurt and crying. Amen. It's, it reminds me of the scripture in Genesis where the Bible said the souls of the men were under the, not Genesis, Revelation, the souls of the, the saints. I'm talking about the tribulation saints that were under the altar. And they were crying and saying, God, how long? Amen. The same question that we're asking, God, how long before you actually restore us? Amen. Before you actually redeem us or deliver us from what is taking place in this world? I mean, we, we've, right before our eyes, we are seeing where scriptures are being fulfilled. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 to 4 says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Amen. That's a funny thing. Because nowadays, everything that people speak about, and I tell you all the time, and I've said it all the time, even in Bible study, that we really have become lovers of our own selves. All people talk about now is themselves. All people talk about is themselves. Amen. Love yourself. You don't care about what anybody else thinks. That's not what scriptures teach. Scripture says you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if you love yourself, you should have a similar love for your neighbor. But we are seeing scriptures being fulfilled where men have become lovers of their own selves. They have become covetous. They have become boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. And, 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 and let me stop here. Without natural affection actually means that normally I mean, it's norm I mean, for a man to love a woman and for a woman to love a man. No, they're saying that, look here, love who you want to love. So man seemingly start loving man and woman starting loving woman and it becomes like a normal thing in society. We have become truth breakers. We have become false accusers, incontinent, fears and despisers of those that are good. And that is true. As a child of God, when you begin to declare good things, these are the people that people don't like anymore. I mean, people don't like people who call the good things good. They want you to call good things bad and bad things good. We have become traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure 
more than lovers of God. Amen. And, 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 and it, it, it's interesting, amen, that we are seeing all of these things that Paul spoke to Timothy about being fulfilled in our world. Amen. And, 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 and I couldn't end with the world in retrospect without looking at even the coronavirus. Amen. Because this has become the biggest, one of the biggest challenge uh, in the 21st century. Amen. We realized that in China, amen, they, were, they came about in about December or late, closer to December 2019. We realized that people were having this respiratory uh, infection. Amen. And it, for some strange reason, it affected China and then it spread, amen, around the globe. To the point now where it becomes a pandemic, where people are affected by it. But brethren, the fact that it's not just that the coronavirus come, but the coronavirus has affected the work of many child of God. I was talking to a friend today and I was telling them that I strongly believe that the coronavirus has been used as a shifter. Or a sifter, that's the better word, a sifter. In other words, just like when you are, uh, when you are making flour, amen, you put the flour in and you shift it out, you sift it out, amen, and you take out what is not needed, amen. In a similar way, what we realize is happening is that many children of God, amen, because we are not coming to the house of God as we used to, amen, because we are not in the sanctuary we can't hide no more along the crowd so we are beginning to see who is who we are beginning to see who really loves god amen we're beginning to realize that there are a lot of people who are hiding in the crowd praise god and because there was no relationship with god amen we realize that a lot of people have been left by the wayside praise god so this coronavirus is causing a shifting or sifting amen in the house of god now we are beginning to see who is who Amen. And I strongly believe as children of God that the only thing that is going to keep us focused is not just about having the Christian walk, but it's actually knowing that what is ahead of you is greater than what we are experiencing now. Amen. The Bible says in, it was the prophet, amen, Isaiah and the prophet uh, Hosea, or Haggai, sorry, who actually declared that every what shall be shaken will be shaken. So I strongly believe that every level of society we talk about the moral part of it we talk about the the financial part of it we talk about what is happening even in the in the natural disasters everything that can be shaken is actually being shaken today praise god so as a child of god if our focus is on the wrong thing in this time if our focus is on what we can get in this life of our focus is on what this world has to offer we're going to quickly realize after a time they mean that it is damaging and even dangerous because as night follows day this world is on its way to a doom amen so as we walk this christian journey praise god our focus should be on our destiny in god amen keep your eyes on the prize and i want to say that again keep your eyes on the prize amen it's just like peter when he walked on the water the moment he took his eyes off jesus he began to sink child of god no it's not the season to be so distracted by what is happening around us now is not the season to allow things that are in this world to shift us amen from the things of god amen but every child of god must understand that our destiny our focus must be on the prize it was paul who says in first corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24 to 25 know he not that they which run in a race run all but one receive it the prize so i'm saying look here corinth so run that he may obtain i'm here to tell somebody that run this race that you may obtain the prize run this race because there is something ahead of you don't give up keep running keep focused because there is a destiny there is some things in god that is going to blow your mind don't allow the devil to trip you up and to make you look to the left or look to the right amen keep your eyes fixed 
and that finish mark. So he said, run that he may obtain the price. He said, so that every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. No, they do it obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. In other words, he was saying that when the people in this world are running their race, amen, and we are going to see a lot of race over these few weeks, amen, even what is happening in the Olympics right now, amen, we're going to see a lot of race, a lot of different events, amen, and people have been training, praise God, so that they can get a prize. And Paul is saying, look here, these people do these things. To obtain an incorruptible crown. Can you imagine the one that we are going to get? Hallelujah. It's a praise God. They run that they can get a corruptible crown. Sorry. Amen. But can you imagine we as children of God? Amen. Keep your eyes on the prize. Because that prize that you're going to get in God is an incorruptible, incorruptible, incorruptible prize. As I said earlier, our destiny, and I want to define the uh, the term destiny so we can all have a good idea of where or what I'm talking about as I use the term in this Bible study our destiny can be defined as the event that will necessarily happen to a particular person or thing in the future let me say that again our destiny can be defined as the events that will necessarily happen to a particular person in this case we're talking about the ecclesia in this case we're talking about the church the called out ones so we're looking at the things that will happen to you if you keep your focus if you keep your eyes on the prize if you keep going along this journey don't stop moving don't stop walking amen our destiny also can be defined as the predetermined praise god uh usually inevitable or irresistible course of events amen in other words god has already predetermined in scripture some things that is for the child of god amen there are some things that you can get amen there are some things that god has in store for you that will blow your mind amen if you hold on to this thing the bible says amen that eyes have not seen praise god nor ears heard neither have it entered into the hearts of man the things which god has prepared for those who love him paul said that in first corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 in other words there are some things for you amen some predetermined things amen some things that god has put down for the person who is willing to hold out unto the end and as we look at the different apostles and their perspective, amen, of what is happening in this world, we realize that they had one focus as they go along. No wonder they were so powerful because these men lived, amen, these men lived as, as men and that should be the apostle Peter's perspective praise God they lived amen because they knew that there was something great for them so Peter says in 2nd Peter chapter 1 and verse 4 whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these he might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corrupt that is in the world through lust so Peter is saying that look here God has in store some one Something that is both exceedingly great in the sense of it being large and imposing. It is great. And guess what? They are promising and they are precious in the sense of the fact that they are valuable. There are some things that God in store for you that is so great and so valuable that if you lose out on it, it's going to blow your mind. Amen. But I like, you see, many of us go through some things in this life. Amen. And we think that it's only we alone have experienced these things. We think that sometimes the devil would want to trick you up to make you feel like, oh boy, when you go through a situation, give up because it's me alone going through this. Amen. It's me alone they're talking about. It's me alone having this bad experience. Amen. But as I was looking in the scriptures, I realized how far that is from the truth. As a matter of fact, if some of us had went through some of the things that the apostles went through, amen, we would not have uh, made it because at the end of the day, they went through a lot under God. Amen. But let us look, for example, at what the apostle Paul 
as he described uh, some of the events that took place in his life. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23 to 30, he says, In labors more abundance, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in death often. In other words, he was describing some of the stuff that he has went through. He says from the Jews, five times have I received 40 stripes minus one. You know, it was a thing that the Jews would actually um, beat you, amen, or punish you with stripes, but they can only give you 39. Why they give you 39 is because if they go over 40, amen, they could have been uh, charged for it. It was the Romans only allowed them to strike you 40 times. So what they do? They give you 39 just to ensure that they do not go over the 40. Amen. But look at this. He said in stripes above measure. So he was describing two types of stripes here. One, he was describing the stripes that he got from his brethren, the Jews. And he was describing stripes that he got from the heathens. So in one case, he got 40 minus 1. But we don't even sure how much he got from the heathens. Praise God. He said, three times was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. My God, I remember the stone him one time and they left him outside of the city. Amen. And that's the time where he wrote the scripture where he said he was caught up into the third heavens and he saw it. the man was literally dead. He said, three times was I shipwrecked. He said, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often. He said, in perils of waters. In perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the gentiles, you know, the man have trouble on every side, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in, say, in weariness. In, imagine Paul was saying there are times he become weary and toil, in sleeplessness after enough time the man can't find place to sleep. Amen. He said, in hunger and thirst. Amen. The man went, this is the man preaching the gospel. Amen. And many times he was hungry. And in many times he was thirsty. He said, in fasting often. In other words, I strongly believe him put that right after that. Because sometimes he had no other choice but to fast. He said, in cold and nakedness. The man was going through a lot. He was going through enough. Praise God. His troubles were very much. Amen. But I strongly believe that the Apostle Paul understood two main things. One, he understood that the journey would not be easy. Can I tell somebody something? When we spoke about the journey last week, we did speak about the mountaintops, but we did mention the valleys. And Paul understood even from his, from, 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 he understood clearly that the journey that he was about to partake would not be an easy one. So that was the first thing he understood. But more importantly, I mean, Paul understood that what was ahead was far greater than our present situation. Amen. So the Bible says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, they were written for our learning that we, through patience, and come part of the scriptures might have hope. In other words, I, 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 I will hold on to that word hope there a little bit. Brethren, can I tell you something? Right now we see the craziness, as I said, that was happening in the world. We see the, the, the madness that is happening in the financial sectors. And even if we take it home to church, a lot of us get discouraged by what we are seeing even in the house of God. Amen. We see where brethren, amen, no longer know how to show love. Amen. We see where people have become cold towards each other. We see where, as Paul said, we have become lovers of our own selves. But Paul says, look here, all that he went through, and he mentioned this to the Romans, he said they were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope can i tell somebody there is a hope there is a destiny ahead of you there are some things in front of you that is going to blow your mind amen and all you need to do is hold on to to the promises of god look at what paul says and before we even go there let us just jump on this whole thing about hope amen god wants us to know that we can have hope in him between Psalm 42 
and Psalm 43, we find the psalmist looking at his painful experiences. We find the, the psalmist going through uh, a high level of spiritual depression and discouragement. Amen. The man was going through a lot. And it, it must have been because he emphasized what he was saying about three different times. In Psalm chapter 42 and verse 5. In Psalm chapter 42 and verse 11. And in Psalm chapter 43 verse 5. We see him asking the same question. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Amen. In a similar way, a lot of us. I mean, based on what we have been going through, we are asking a similar question. We are saying, God, why are all these things happening? Why is it so hard in this time to even find food to put on the table? Why is it so hard, oh God, amen, in this time, amen, to provide for my family as I should? Why is it so hard, Jesus, amen? Why is it that the brethren can love like we should? God, this is discouraging. And he, was, he felt he was walking probably with his head down. Why? But he asked the question to himself. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? But I love the fact that while he asked the question, he gave the answer to the questions. Amen. And the answer lies is the same answer I'm going to give you today. He made a point. When we talk about hope, he says in Psalm chapter 42 and verse 5, hope Thou in God. He said, For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. He said, Chapter 42 and verse 11, Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. He says in Psalm chapter 43 and verse 5, Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Can I tell somebody tonight that you need to have your hope in God? Things are happening. Yes, things are happening on the different arenas and in the different scenes. But guess what? Why are you cast down on your soul? And why are you disquieted? Guess what? Hope. But there's hope in anything. Hope in God. For he is the health of your countenance. In other words, he's the one that's going to lift your countenance. But you know the only way he can do that? Because we know that in God, it goes way beyond the, 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 the framework of time. Amen. A lot of us think that things are going to go on forever and forever and forever. But can I tell you that when you hope in God, amen, there's a whole heap ahead of you. Praise God. So Paul says some things to the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. For this cause, what cause? For this cause. In other words, after I've got through everything that you are going through, having gone through this journey, you become weary and you get beaten and your struggles and whatever. For this cause, we fear not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. He said, for our light afflictions. And every time I read that scripture, I, I, I smile. Because I'm like, God, some of these afflictions that we are going through just don't seem light at all. Some of these afflictions that we are going through seem heavy. But Paul described all the things that we are going through as our light afflictions, which is but for a moment. He said it worked for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He said while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In other words, the Apostle Paul was simply making this point. Your afflictions, your pain, your suffering, your calamity, amen, in this life, in the measure of your destiny, in the measure of eternity, amen, it is practically weightless. It's practically feathery. Amen. And guess what? Not only that, it only occur for a split second. When you compare what God has for you, amen, in comparison to what you're going through, they, they measure nothing. It's like putting a grain of sand in the balance. Amen. It doesn't even move the scale because everything that we go through, Holy Ghost, everything that happens in our life, praise God, is a light affliction and it's 
but for a moment. Paul also made another statement. When we look at everything that was happening in the world, when we look at the fact that, that, that the, 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 the crime rate in our country is going up. I mean, people are afraid. I, I don't know how people want to enjoy this world anymore because you might just go anywhere and you, you just hear shooting happening. You hear that this happening, you get, get caught up in that. Amen. So Paul made us a, a profound statement also in second in First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9. He said, if in this life only we have hope, you will see that word again. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of men most miserable. Praise God. Paul only applied this principle to the Christians. He was practically saying. We are all men most miserable in the sense that for the unbeliever, if this life alone gives us any chance of pleasure, amen, and, and, and any form of happiness, then what is the difference for the unbeliever and the saved person? We know that for the unbeliever, their life of happiness ends here. But for us, if we only get happiness here, Amen. If the only happiness you have is when you come to church. Amen. And, and it ends here. What does it profit you? We are but we have men most miserable. One, one, one translation, put it this way. With all I with all I have endured for Jesus Christ, if there is not a resurrection and a heavenly reward beyond this life, I am a fool to be pitied. In other words, with everything that we have, if, if, if the fact that we only have hope in this life, then it don't make no sense. But there is a destiny ahead of you. Paul was addressing what was taking place in the church of Corinth. And what was happening, if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, they were practically uh, now confused about what was taking place, praise God, in their church. They strongly believed that Jesus was coming back in their time. And they lived their life that way. But there came a time where the saints began to die. Amen. And people were dying. And they were wondering what will happen. Um, why are the saints dying? And Paul had to write in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and tell them about the resurrection. And tell them that Jesus was the first fruit of them that slept. And tell them that, look here, look here, at the end of the day, don't worry about the saints dying. Amen. What is going to happen is that our hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen. And our hope is not what is happening in this life, but our hope is in the fact that Jesus Christ died, he buried, and he rose from the dead. And just like how he is the first fruit of them that slept, brethren, the brethren that die are going to rise again. But guess what? Beyond that, we have some great things ahead of us. Can I tell you something? Job made a profound statement. He said, man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. You ask the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? And he said, all the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. In other words, I'm here to tell somebody that, look here, what is happening here? Wait. Because guess what? Your change is coming. Wait. There's some stuff happening. We, we have a few days. It is full of trouble. But guess what happened? Our hope is not here. There is an appointed time. Wait. Understand. Keep your eyes on the prize. Amen. Peter also said, Blessed be the God and Father. And I'm using these scriptures for us to understand why we should not challenge or channel our mind along this world. Amen. Everything that is happening in this world, we're going to pass away. But Peter said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us again unto a lively hope. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. And that faded not away. Reserved in heaven for you. In other words, he said that our hope, our lively hope. Amen. Is an inheritance that is incorruptible. And it's undefiled. And it faded not away. And guess what, brethren? It is reserved in heaven for who? For you. For the child of God. For the person who is willing to hold out. Hallelujah. And to the end. Because there is something in store for you. Amen. We have a lively hope. We have a hope that is imperishable. Amen. Other things might fade away. Amen. But what we have in Christ. Praise God. Will going to blow your mind.
When we think about uh, people who aspire to become great men, you have great monarchs that have come over the years, but all of these things practically have faded before our eyes. But guess what? We have a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and don't fade away. And guess what? It is reserved in heaven for you. Now, I want you to understand, child of God, as we move ahead, that I just want us to bring our attention to some of the things that God has in store for us. I want to bring our attention to some of the things that God has in store for you as a child of God. When you hold on to Jesus Christ, there are some mighty things that are in store for you. Now, all of us are aware that the next big event on the uh, calendar based on prophecy, based on what we call eschatology, comes from the word eschatology, the word, the first part of eschaton, it actually means the end days or the last days, amen? And practically what he's saying is that on that, when you study that, you realize that the next big event on the scene for the child of God is the rapture. The Bible says we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye at the last trump. Amen. The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds and so shall we forever be with the Lord. But guess what? Not only that we will be changed, but God has some stuff in store for us, you see. Amen. The Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ. And I, I recently have been doing some teaching as it relates to the judgments. And I'm not going into those. Amen. But we, when they talk about the judgment seat, I said we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That is in 2 Corinthians 5.10. Amen. It's not talking about the white throne judgment. So since we're in Bible study, let me clear that up for you. You have these are two major judgment seats. You have three actually. But the two major ones that we can talk about is the judgment seat of Christ, which is the one we're going to talk about. And you have what is called the white throne judgment or the great white throne judgment where the unrighteous dead is going to be. But Jesus is saying that we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he had done, whether it be good or bad. Romans chapter 14 and verse 10 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, there is a judgment seat. Now the judgment seat, is, that word judgment seat there in the Greek is the word bima. Amen. And this was familiar um, term to the people of Paul's day. Now, what the beamer was, brethren, it was practically an elevated platform and before which contestants would pass and receive their rewards or their crown. Can I tell you, when the rapture takes place, the next big event for the church, for you, the next destined event for you is that you will appear appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Praise God. And guess what? When you appear before that elevated platform, amen, what you'll be doing is you'll be receiving your reward, receiving your crown. Now, this judgment seat, and let me just bring this out, is not a judgment of condemnation. Amen. In other words, at this point in time, you would have already been in heaven. Amen. So God is not judging you for sin. When the Bible says you shall appear before the judgment seat. But what God is judging you is for your works that you have done. Child of God, can I tell you something? There are some massive things in store for you. If you keep your focus. Amen. It's a place of reward. And God has some things that will blow your mind. Praise God. Hallelujah. So guess what? The phrase judgment seat means the, it's like a step. It's just like when we watch the Olympics and you see the, the athletes go up and the person that is on the first, the highest part, go there. And the person that is on the second part, go here and third. Amen. To the left and the right. Amen. And somebody would walk up to them and they would put the, 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 the medal around their necks. Can you believe somebody walking up to you? Amen. And placing uh, that particular crown on your head. Praise God. So it is. Amen. With the child of God. God is going to come and he's going to give you a prize. Amen. That is going to blow your mind. So guess what happened now? The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13 to 14. He said, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do. 
You say forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth for those things which are before. You say I press toward the mark for the prize. There is a prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. We can you imagine when you stand before Jesus Christ. You say everything that you're running down now, everything that seems valuable right now, will mean nothing when you stand before Christ. I mean, the other day I posted something. I said there's going to come a day when people are going to either wish they were born again i wish they were not born at all amen in a similar sense amen when we stand before christ even at this time we need to count ourselves to have not apprehended but this one thing we must do as children of god forgetting those things which are behind amen some failures you have made last year some issues you have, you, 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 you. There are some stuff that has happened to you, amen, in your life. There are some problems that have came your way. There are some things that the devil would want to remind you of. Amen. I want to make you feel condemned. But guess what? There is therefore no, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Amen. The moment you get back up yourself and you dust yourself off, forget those things which are behind. And guess what? Reach for those things which are before you. Press towards the mark because there is a prize there is a prize there is a prize there's a prize of the high calling of god in christ jesus praise god so the apostle and the scriptures in general talk about five different crowns that we will receive and i'm going to highlight for the sake of bible study for us to understand that when you hold on long enough amen to this thing when you realize that look here there are some crowns ahead of you there's something destined for you amen you're going to hold out so the bible talk about the crown of righteousness you talk about the crown of glory you talk about the incorruptible crown you talk about the crown of rejoicing you talk about the crown of life and i'm going to tell you what this word crown means as we go along but child of god Hold on to these things. No, let's just look at each of them individually so we can get a good idea of some of the things that we are destined for. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 78 says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, my God, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only. In other words, Paul was saying to Timothy, it's not me alone I will get it. Amen. It's not you alone, Timothy, you will get it. Amen. But Paul probably looked down the course of life, and he saw people like you, amen, who are practically fighting the fight, amen, and trying to keep the course, and trying to keep the faith. And he's saying there is laid up for you also a crown of life. Amen. A crown of righteousness. Sorry. And he said, not me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. Amen. So the crown of righteousness is for those who love his appearing. Amen. The crown of righteousness, praise God, is a crown for every righteous person who has gone through this christian walk by grace amen the bible tell you different scriptures that highlight about this crown of righteousness second timothy we just read that one romans chapter 3 and verse 24 it says being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in christ jesus in other words we are justified freely by his grace praise god galatians chapter 5 and verse 5 says for we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith there is a hope of righteousness by faith philippians chapter 3 and verse 9 says and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is true faith of jesus christ the righteousness which is in god by faith so brethren there is a crown of righteousness for people who love the appearing crown of righteousness for people who are looking for the fact that jesus is coming again amen the one of the bible said to them that look for him look for jesus amen because guess what there is a crown of righteousness in store for you then the bible talk about the crown of glory first peter chapter 5 verse 1 to 4 the elders which are among you i exhort whom i whom am also an elder 
and a witness of the suffering of Christ. Amen. And also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lugar, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, my God. In other words, God is telling the children of God, are telling the leaders, the people who practically, amen, who faithfully shepherd the flock, the people who faithfully minister, amen, and bring across the word of God, not for filthy lugar. He said that when you do these things, when the chief shepherd, I don't know who the chief shepherd is, the chief shepherd is Jesus Christ. When he shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory. And guess what happened to this crown? It don't fade away. In other words, ministers, anybody who deliver the word of God, praise God, elders, amen, persons who are, are, are doing the work of God, sometimes people going to come with things to try to discourage you. People going to try to undermine your ministry. Amen. And look at the work, amen, that Bishop Daly has been doing. And a lot of people question and will talk and try to come against the man of God. Amen. But I encourage him, amen, as I encourage every minister, amen, that must continue to do the work of God with your best ability, not for filthy lucre. Do it willingly. Do it with a ready mind and don't do it as Lord over God's heritage, but be an example to the flock. And guess what happened? When the chief shepherd shall appear, amen, he shall, you shall receive a crown of glory. So in summary, the crown of glory is for men who have given themselves faithfully to the shepherding of the flock. Amen. Praise God. Then you have what is called the incorruptible crown. He says, ye know ye not that they which run in a race, amen, uh, run all, praise God, that but one received the prize. I will say that earlier, praise God. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. No, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible crown, I read this earlier, but incorruptible crown is for those who exercise self-control and strive to be the best that you can be in the Lord. You see, there are some things that the enemy would want to bombard your mind with, amen, as you walk this journey. There are some stuff that the devil would want to tell you, say, divert and go to this. Why don't you try this? Amen. This nobody not see you. Amen. You know, make us do it, man. It's just like a fun. But God is saying that there is an incorruptible crown for persons who can exercise self-control. Persons who are willing to strive for the best that they can be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God is going to give you an incorruptible crown. Praise God. Then we look at the crown of rejoicing. This is for what is your hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. Teen. So the crown of rejoicing, brethren, is for those who have given themselves to winning others for Christ. Amen. So the Bible actually encourages us, amen, that, 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 that God, amen, will give a crown for people, amen, who are willing to go out there and to, to set themselves, amen, who put themselves at, in every chance they get to win souls for Christ. Praise God. There are people who have more than one type of crown in heaven. And you know, the truth be told, as we look at these crowns, we realize that you can fit into more than one category. Just like when we have the award ceremony, you might get a crown for winning the 200 meter race, and you might get a crown to win the 100 meter race. Don't believe that it's only one crown alone you can get. But at the end of the day, ensure that when God tries your work, when God look at your motive, when God examine you, and you see if your, your work is wood, hay or stubble, and when God going to try it with fire, praise God. So ensure that when God tries your work, amen, that it comes out as good, come out as gold or precious stone or silver, amen. So that's the crown of rejoicing. Then we have the crown of life. He says, fear none of these things which shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that he may be tried. And he shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, 
and I will give thee a crown of life. In other words, the crown of life for those who endure trials and tribulation. Amen. And, and, and God is saying, blessed is the man that endured temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. That's James chapter 1 and verse 12. So when we realize what is happening is that God is going to give people, amen, the crown of life because you have endured tribulation. And trust me, some persons are going to go through some things. When I look about the, the situation like what happened in Ethiopia, uh, where men died for this gospel. When you look at what the Apostle Paul and his men went through, the tribulation and the troubles and the trials, they are going to receive a crown of life. Brethren, if it come to the, the, the case where you are going through certain situations and trials, understand that it's not for north. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we have men most miserable. And even if God doesn't repay you, as it were, in this life, even though he promised to give us a hundredfold, amen, in this life, and so on and so forth, it doesn't matter. If you don't get that blessing here, there is a crown. Can you imagine when you stand on a podium, amen, and you look and you see Jesus Christ come and he comes with that crown and he gives it to you. It going to blow your mind. It going to blow your mind. Amen. But you know the funny thing about it? When we have received all of these crowns, the Bible says that we are going to cast them down at his feet. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10 to 11 says, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. Amen. And they worship him that liveth forever and ever. And guess what they did? They cast their crown before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are that are created in other words the 20 and 4 elders theologians or everybody who studied scriptures realized that the 20 and 4 elders represented the redeemed of God in heaven amen amen we know who they are because if we're reading that same revelation chapter 4 amen it tell you about the song that they sung amen I think it's chapter 4 or 5 but it tell you about the song that they sung that they were redeemed from the earth by the blood so we know it's a representation of, of, of the, the church in heaven but when they get the crowns guess what they do they cast it at his feet. The word crown there is not the word diadem. Diadem is what Jesus is going to have. The word crown there is the word Stephanos. And it actually speaks to a crown of victory. Amen. It speaks to a, a crown of, it's not, it's not a royalty crown. It's a crown of achievement, of winning. The same that kind of athlete we received in the, in the Olympic Games. What you get, when you get your crown of rejoicing, when you get your crown of life, when you get your crown of um, incorruptible crown, your crown of glory, your crown of righteousness is Stephanos, a ah, crown of victory. You have overcome. You have overcome. Can you imagine that, that excitement in your heart? We have overcome. Amen. We are no longer having to be worried about this life. When we look back and we see all the things that, has, that, that we have gone through, all the troubles that we have endured, when we look at back in our lives and we see all the struggles and the many times that, that the devil was whispering and saying, give up. When we look back and we say, boy, we look at all the things that were happening, the things that were flashing before our eyes and saying, come here, do this, blah, blah, blah. And you were willing, amen, to endure to the end amen and you stand upon that podium you, trust me a lot of us no wonder the bible said god we have wiped some tears i know in one sense if you look at it from a negative sense where uh people are crying because they didn't get anything because their motive was wrong but i strongly believe there are going to be tears of joy probably too because at the end of the day you, you don't even know how to express the emotion you know joy sometimes comes and it comes with crying too you're so happy when god put that stephanos that crown of victory that crown of of achievement amen upon it a winning athlete crown amen we know fight like anyone beating the air but we know at the end of the day that christ came and he gave us victory but guess what that is just the tip of the iceberg because there is the reward of heaven also. There is the reward of heaven. Amen. And can I tell you, brethren, many times we preach about the suffering if we miss out. A lot of times where preachers will preach, and it is so true. If you miss out on this thing, you're going to suffer. 
You're going to have extreme suffering. The Bible tells you these things. You know, there's a teaching going about now telling people that, look here, there's no such place as hell. But in the Bible, teach it. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. And if we read Revelation chapter 20, later on it tells you about people who was before the great white throne, who is cast into the same place. When you're in that place of suffering, your memory is going to be very active. Luke chapter 16 and verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receive thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. So guess what happened? The man's memory was still active about what he was going through. You're going to have unsatisfied desires also. Luke chapter 16 verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. In other words, he was able to feel the flame. He was able to feel thirst. Amen. There's an unsatisfied uh, uh, unsatisfied desire you're going to have remorse also luke chapter 16 verse 27 to 28 it says then he said i pray thee therefore father thou, thou wouldest send him to my father's house for i have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they all should come into this place in other words you have a remorse about what was taken you are sorry amen so many times we look in scriptures and the, 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 the list goes on the worm is not going to die the fire is not going to be quenched praise god you're going to have darkness you're going to have no rest Revelation 14, 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest, nor day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and who shall receive it, the mark of his name. So we are going to a place, amen, where there's going to be, or there's a place where you, 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 if you miss the blessings of God, if you miss the destiny that God has in store for the church, you're going to suffer. Tell the person beside you, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Type it. Don't miss it. Because guess what? There is a heaven to gain. And it was Ralph Reynolds who, who said this and I took it from uh, the truth shall triumph directly from it. He says, uh, there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And guess why? Both heaven and hell are forever and ever and ever. So, while we not emphasizing the hell part of it, I just want to bring it out for us to realize that there is a heaven to gain. For the child of God, your destiny is not torment. Your destiny is not a place of fire and unsatisfied desire and extreme suffering. Amen. When we live for God, we are destined for some great things in heaven. John, the revelator, the apostle, the one that died a natural death, the last apostle to die. He wrote in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 and 2. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. He says, and there were no more seas. And I, John, saw the holy city. The new Jerusalem coming down from God, hallelujah, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Do not miss it. The apostle John said he saw this new city. And guess what happened? When he described this city, it makes my mind, it, apart from getting all these crown, I want to be a witness of what is going to take in place. According to the scripture earlier, which says, eyes have not seen. I want to see it. Ears have not heard. I want to hear the singing. Neither have it entered in the hearts of men. The things that God has in store for them that love. It is so magnificent. Uh, even in me trying to describe it to you. Amen. I, I, I can't even measure up to how it really looks. He says, look here. John describing the city. He said the walls are made up of the most precious stone. He says it is made up of the jasper. 
is made up of the sapphire. It's made up of the emerald and the topaz. Oh my God, I want to see just to name a few of the stones. He said the walls of the city is about 144 cubits, which would be equal to about 216 feet. Amen. He said the city measured about 12 furlongs, which is about 1,500 miles. I'm saying the length of the city and the breadth of the city and the height of the city are all equal. In other words, it's a perfect cube. What a place. My God. I want to see it. Praise God. And not only that, you're talking about the new heaven. God also talk about the new earth. Because this earth that we're seeing, you ever go to some places yet, go up to the blue mountain or go to some hills and you look across and how the place look pretty. And God said, all of these things is going to be Fire is going to get rid of it. And there's going to be a new earth. And guess what? In this new earth, there's going to be no more sea. We just read that a while ago in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. And guess what? The only thing is that there's going to be the river of life. And guess what? It is going to flow from the throne. And you're going to water the whole earth. So, it's going to be a little different. Be careful, picture it. You're seeing heaven. Hanging above the earth. And from the heaven, there is a river flowing to the earth. And it's watering the whole earth. And guess what? This river contains no impurities. And the river is so beautiful. It is as clear as crystal. It will be pure and clean. And apart from the fact that there is a river to the sides, you will have what is called a tree of life. And you will have the leaves of the particular tree. Amen. We have healing properties, which means that people are going to inhabit the earth. Amen. And what is going to happen is that the, the leaf that is from that tree will make sure that they live forever. It reminds me of the tree that was in the Garden of Eden. You're going to be like the leaf of life. What? A, you, you want me to start out? The Bible said in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4 and 5. And God shall wipe away. And it's talking about the characteristics now of the city. God is going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow. Nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Amen. And he that sat upon the throne said. Behold I make all things new. And he said unto me. Write. For these words are true and faithful. Amen. Praise God. I, I, I strongly believe that, that when, when, when you look at this particular verse, it should make you want to jump for joy. I remember Sister Nurse talking Sunday and said, boy, she never know that old, being older comes with so much problems, come with pain and come with this and heartache and all of these type of things that she spoke about. Amen. But here it is that you should be happy. Because guess what? What you are destined for is going to blow your mind. There's going to be no more tears. There's going to be no more death. There's going to be no more sorrow. There's going to be no more pain. There's going to be no more night. No more lies. No more curse. No more sun. Because Jesus himself is going to be the light of the city. My God, what a place. Probably you could say no more. Probably type that. No more. No more troubles. Hallelujah. No more troubles. In, I mean, you can imagine being in a place. And the Bible talks about in his presence there is fullness of joy. Amen. So everything that we think that we are experiencing right now, we experience partial joy, man. We experience partial this. And a glimpse and a little touch. But when we are near, there is so much joy. It going to blow your mind. Can you imagine a place where your worst enemy, death, going to be destroyed? Can you imagine a place where sin and death will be a thing of the past? Man, I, want, I can't miss out on that. I can't miss out on that. There's a song I love and I always use this song. It said, for there is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. Amen. On that happy golden shore. What a day. Glorious day that will be. He says there will be no sorrow there. No more burdens to bear. No more sickness. No more pain. No more parting over there. 
And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, a glorious day that will be. And as I talk about the fact that we will be with the one who died for me, I want us to understand that one of the greatest reward, our greatest destiny, is that Jesus himself is going to be our greatest reward. Our greatest reward, child of God, is not the crown. Our greatest reward is not even the fact that we're going, you're going, you're going to have a city where the Lamb is the light. Amen. Our greatest reward is not the fact that we're going to see a river, we're going to have the tree of life. Our greatest reward is, is, is the fact that we're going to be conformed to the image of our Lord and Savior. It was, it, was, it was Abraham who said in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Charles Spurgeon, famous theologian, him said this, and I quote, I do not think that any human mind can ever grasp the fullness of meaning of these four words. In other words, a lot of us, we say it, but I don't even think we begin to really grasp it because we don't understand really what we say, Jesus is the ultimate reward. He says, I am thy reward. God himself going to be the reward of his faithful people. My God. And trust me, you can't have a better prize, a better reward, a better destiny than to know that you're going to be like Jesus. Amen. The Bible says, and we know that all things, the preacher preach about it, work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Why? To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Praise God. In other words, the same image the same body, the same things that Jesus had when he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. You're going to have it. Amen. No matter what they did to Jesus, Jesus was not perturbed because he knew that when he was changed, he was going to be changed from mortal to immortality. You know that it's incorrupt, it's corrupt, but going to put an incorruption. Can you imagine? He was so powerful that while the disciples were locked away in a room, Jesus just appeared before them. Amen. And to show that he was not spirit, he said to Thomas, touch me hand. Because he was not spirit. He had a body. He was not a disembodied spirit. He, was, he had a body. And we are going to be conformed to the image of his son. In the sense we're going to have a body. In the sense that we're going to have his mind. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. We're going to have his mind. The Bible says that he gave some apostles. And some prophets. And some evangelists. And some pastors and teachers. And he told you the purpose. That is why we should not try to. Hit against the prick. God put them for a purpose. God put the ministers and the men of God in place for a purpose. You might not be in agreement with everything, but God is working on our behalf. Amen. To put us and to bring us to the place where we want to be. He said, for this purpose, for the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. And he tell you why now. Till we all come. So it gives you the, the, what God's plan is for us, God's destined for us, that we all come into the unity of the faith. And in the knowledge of the Son of God, and to a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Can I tell you something, brethren? We are, there's going to come a time where we're going to come to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Can I tell you something, brethren, in concluding? The Bible says in 1 John 3, 1 to 3, Behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. He said, therefore the world knoweth us not. In other words, don't be perturbed. Amen. When you're, you're going through some things and you feel out of place in this world. The world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, nor are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, right now, God is still working on us. God is still framing us. God is still, it's like, it's like the potter. You're on the wheel and God is working. So we don't know uh, what, what, what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, in other words, what God is doing, God is looking at himself. And God is saying, this is me, the man Christ Jesus. And God is using that imagery. And he's using, he's, he's putting like the artist. And put the picture beside. And he's framing out or he's painting that painting. He's painting your life to make sure that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. My God. For we shall see him as it is. And I want to make this last thing. 
point as I close, it says, and every man, we spoke about the hope, that have this hope in him, purified himself even as he is pure. In other words, knowing our eternal destiny and living in this hope will purify, we will purify our lives. You see, a lot of people who are contrary because they don't know what's ahead of them. A lot of people willing to, 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 to compromise and, to, and to, to, to live on the edge, amen, and to, to try it because they don't realize that there are some mighty things ahead for you. In, in other words, having this hope that we are going to be like him, having this hope to know that God is, that is working on our lives, it makes us pure because when we know our end is to be more like Jesus, it makes us want to be more like Jesus right now. In other words, because we know that some things are magnificent, things are going to happen. So guess what happened, brethren? We must never set our hope on other things. Don't set your hope on no relationship. Don't set your hope on no success. Don't set your hope on no bank account. Don't set your hope on your health. You know which people were healthy today? And you got the mother, the mother looking saying, You're healthy, you're good until you see the doctor. Amen. In other words, you, you, you feel good now and then you go to the doctor and the doctor tell you you have this particular sickness and ailment. You can't put your hope in that. Amen. Don't put your hope on your possession. Amen. You have something today and you lose it tomorrow. You know, much men during the, the breakdown in 2007 kill themselves because they, they, their financial, them can't see themselves without their possession. Their hope was in their possession. Your hope can't even be in yourself because you might be pretty today and tomorrow you, you lose it. You might think that you are high and tomorrow you lose everything that you have. Our only hope must only be in Jesus Christ because he is our exceedingly great reward. Praise God. I, I close here, but tonight I want us to understand that there are some things that is destined for you as a child of God. There are some things that, that God is, has in store for you. Amen. And God wants us to know, amen, each and every one of us, that, amen, we must hold on to our Christian heritage. Hold on to it with all your heart. Don't let it go. It is what is going to keep you. You must hold on to your Christian identity. Remember that, look here, God's identity for you is to be, look like him, to be like him. Amen. Jesus is our ultimate identity. It's not this world. You must, look, you must make sure that when you walk this Christian walk, understand that, look here, there are some enemies that you're going to fight against. There's the world. There's the devil. Amen. There's your flesh. But keep the walk. Keep walking. As I said last week, if you're going through your valley experience, amen, what do you do when you're in your valley? You keep on walking because God is going to make you into a pearl. I know why you're going to keep on walking because you're going to keep your eyes on the prize because God has some things destined for you there are some crowns for you there's heaven for you we even talk about the marriage supper of the lamb there's a lot of things amen that I have I've left off praise God amen that that practically could have went into but we have limited time amen but I just wanted to touch us Touch our hearts. Remind us of few things. Amen. That look here. There is a destiny for you. There is something that God has destined for you. And all you have to do is be faithful to the end. The Bible says, And every man that have this hope in him, purify himself, even as Jesus, he is pure. I pray, God, that you will be blessed tonight. Bow your heads tonight as we pray. Mighty God, we exalt you tonight. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we realize that if it's in this life only we have hope in Christ, we have men most miserable. But I'm happy that we have a lively hope. We have a hope that one day, amen, all this heartache, all this trouble, all these things that are in our lives, amen, all the messy things, amen, that all these things that have come our way, we would thank God that Jesus that this is not our final Amen. We we'll realize that there is some things ahead of us. Amen. That we not even can even picture in our minds. Amen. Even the greatest and the most beautiful thing in this world fade in comparison. Amen. To what you have in store for us. We ask you right now just to help us to keep our minds focused on that prize. Help us, Lord, just not be distracted in this time. In this time where many, God, have, are losing their way. What is happening in this COVID? A lot of people have not been coming to church and they have not been praying. They have not been fasting. Amen. They have not been in the word. But I pray, God, that you'll help us, Lord, just to come back, hallelujah, to a state where we want to, uh, hallelujah, we want to, to be with you. 
to be with Jesus. Help us, Lord Jesus, to hunger and to thirst after righteousness that we shall be filled. Help us, Lord Jesus, to, to keep our minds and our focus on the prize, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And help us, Lord Jesus, to shun the very appearance of evil. Hey, Lord Jesus, hallelujah. I pray, now God, you'll touch every sin. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be focused on our Christian destiny, uh, our destiny that you have some things for us. But of all, it's help us, Lord, to realize that we shall be conformed to your image. Our ultimate destiny is to be like Jesus. Our ultimate destiny, hallelujah, is to be in your presence. Hallelujah. To be in the presence of the King of Kings. To tabernacle in your presence. Hallelujah. I just said in the book of Revelation, God, Oh, God, the, the, the tabernacle of God is with men. Amen. And as the angel made that sound, Lord Jesus, that the tabernacle of God is with men. In a similar way, hallelujah, we are happy tonight. We know, God, that from the inception, from the beginning, you have always wanted to dwell with men. But there is coming a day, amen, where the tabernacle of God, hallelujah, the presence of God, the raw presence of God, hallelujah, will be in with men for eternity, forever and forever and forever. Help us, Lord Jesus, to look forward to these things. Hallelujah. To keep our hearts fixed upon you. Hallelujah. To them that look for him shall he appear the second time. Help us to keep our minds focused on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray tonight. Touch every weak saint. Help us Lord Jesus to desire the sincere milk of the word. Touch the strong saints too. That they will continue to keep, keep on walking. And those that are weak that they will find the strength. Hallelujah. In the Holy Ghost. Hakobo. Find the strength in this time to get up. Hallelujah. And to walk this walk hallelujah let no saint let no hoof be left behind in egypt but let every child of god hallelujah gird their loins let every child of god put on their sandals let every child of god make haste because it's time to leave we are in the brink hallelujah about leaving egypt's land to a place that flows with milk and honey to a place oh that's a blessing in you thank you lord for what you have done in the mighty name of jesus we pray tonight in jesus name in jesus name Praise God, praise God, praise God. God richly bless you in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord. Praise God. By way of announcement on Sunday, amen, we have group one, amen, at, for the 9 a.m. service. And we have group two for the 11 uh, a.m. service. I remember group one is for persons who are born January, February, March. And group two are for the persons who are born April, May, and June. Amen. So if you are born in these one of these months and make note of your time and come out and let us worship the Lord. If the Lord will see fit for us to either live to see that time or if we should not put in appearance before that time. Praise God. We also must be reminded that on the 28th and the 29th, amen, of uh, July, amen, we'll be having our communion and right hand of fellowship service. Amen. So on the 28th, I think group one and group two, Amen. Persons who are born that month can come out, but all the persons who are eligible for the right hand will be out. Amen. And on the 29th, the persons who are born group three and four would come out. And again, everybody who is eligible for the right hand of fellowship would come out. So make notes of those dates. Amen. Let us pray much for the service on Sunday and let us keep our focus. Amen. On the destiny that Christ has for us. God bless you. I pray God that you were blessed by these four sessions that we covered tonight and that we'll be encouraged to understand that we have a heritage amen that we have an identity that we are walking this christian walk for one purpose because there is a destiny ahead and we are going to make it god bless you in the mighty name of jesus in jesus name